Welcome to ACC Nation. That's Will Ogden and I'm Jim Quist. And we'd like to welcome our special guest, Sam Newman of the Clemson Insider. Welcome, Sam. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Right up front, man. Just how old really, really is Clemson linebacker James Skalski? Is he 30, 40? You know, just kidding. (laughs) It seems to be the question that's thrown out just you know it's a it's a time filler so i just thought i'd throw it out at you as well because it's so silly uh what can i say scalsy's been around for a while yeah just just a bit right <laughs> <laughs> and uh Dabo's real happy about that. Hey, I'd say our focus is going to be primarily on the offense in this conversation. So right up front, let's get your thoughts on the Georgia Tech game first. Let's talk about the offense and strengths, weaknesses, and what needs to be worked on. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of things need to be worked on. I think we can go ahead and say that. I mean, the Georgia Tech game, I think – you know, they've kind of come out and said that Georgia Tech showed them a lot of things that they weren't expecting this week. And, and that's kind of been the theme. And they've kind of said that Monday, they said it Tuesday, they said it Sunday, they said it Saturday after the game. And that's, they just weren't expecting it. And I mean, they have to adjust and, and make adjustments, but remember you have, I mean, kind of a topic of, of conversation on Monday is, you know, you can make those adjustments with, with those veteran offensive linemen, but they also have a true freshman starting at left guard. So that's, you know, difficult there. And, and um, this is, you know, Brent Venables is defensively brought to Iowa state and it's kind of come full circle. Um, and, and I mean, it really, you know, gave Clemson fits and, and they kind of had the, you know, scrap their game plan and, and, and run the football. Um, and, and they were, they were able to run the football, not, I mean, not as effectively as they wanted to. They only averaged 3.9 yards per carry. That's obviously a number you would like to see go higher, um, especially, but, you know, they kind of had to spot the ball and, and, you know, DJ ran more than he has um, so far this season. I think he should be running more, but he kind of put the team on his back. And besides that fumble where he, you know, was trying to probably do too much, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I thought, you know, there's things in their offense that look good, things that look bad. It's, um, you know, Clemson, this is my first year uh, covering Clemson, but yeah, obviously, you know, I have familiarity with, with the program and how much points we're usually used to accustomed to seeing them put on the board. And, sure, sure. Um, yeah, I think we went into that South Carolina state game, assuming that, okay, this is after the Georgia game, it was like, okay, two powerhouses against each other. They both had great defenses. We can wipe that away. And we're expecting DJ to go out there, you know, go 20 of 26, throw for 200 something yards and four touchdowns. He didn't do that. It, we kind of looked at that as a, as a get right game. Right. And it, even though they put up 49 points, it wasn't that. So then, okay, maybe it was just, you know, still getting the Georgia game out of system and you get to the Georgia Tech game and then kind of the same. So I think the, some of the issues that they have right now is one, DJ doesn't have a lot of time in the pocket. They have issues on the offensive line. The thing, just going through the offensive line, I know I mentioned that they have a, a true freshman at left guard, but they also have two guys playing positions that they hadn't played prior to the season. Jordan McFadden has moved from right tackle to left tackle. Matt Bockhorst, who was their starting left guard last season, is now their starting center. Um, Will Putnam at, at in right guard has, you know, he has experience and Walker Parks is, is doesn't have a lot. And then you have, like I said, a true freshman. So there's that mixed bag there. And I think coming into the season, you know, they wanted to play the five best guys, but is that level of communication? Can they mesh? We really, I don't think we've seen that so far. Um, and unfortunately, offensive line is something that you can only really, you know, they go up against the defense every day in practice, but it's only kind of, you know, baptism by fire. And they talked this week how they like to get um, some of those guys, other guys in there like Paul Tio, um, Mason Trotter, Hunter Rayburn, Mitchell Mays, and they haven't been able to. Um, I think the, the talk coming out of fall camp was that they would like to play, you know, they have depth. That was something they didn't have last year and why they struggled at times. And I think Trevor Lawrence and Travis Etienne were able to mask that, but they only had really five guys that they could trust in the offensive line. And this year they say they have eight or nine, but, you know, Dabo said today, he said tonight that he would like to, and, and yesterday that they would like to get more guys in there and, and rotate them. So obviously the offensive line has created problems. And those problems have probably evolved with, with DJ being a little, he was shaky there's Georgia. 
Um, and he still looks shaky. I think the one thing, um, you know, and, and I went back and, and watching it is Dan Orlovsky, who I think does a terrific job on ESPN, who's a color commentator for the games. If he pointed it out that he's trying to trust his arm a little bit too much. Um, and if you look at it, the footwork is kind of a mess. Uh, and he just kind of needs to get back to the fundamentals of, of you know, running into that footwork. And I, and I know fans are probably like, well, ha- how come, you know, it's it's not happening like the footwork that should be. But it's 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 more than that. I mean, I, if you're having to think about it, it's it's just not there. So I think he's just trying to get back. They're trying to get to back to the basics and the basic fundamentals of with him just being able to execute, you know, some of those throws. I mean, some of the throws that he's sailing on are ones that he should be able to make. And he knows that the team knows that um, I think he's a very talented player. You know, I'm not ready to I'm not ready to jump on on uh, the message boards and say, you know, it's time to bench him because I think, you know, to, you know, fans can be ridiculous at times. I think we all know that. Um, I think yeah. <laughs> it gives them the best chance to win for, first and foremost. And I, and I think. Everybody in the locker room knows that they're they ha- they're behind his back. I mean, the starting center Matt Bockhorst, who has been with the program for five years, he had a fiery interview the other day, which was you know one I've never seen before. But he's like, I, I will go play with five any day of the week, and-, and let's go. So he has the back of his teammates. They all have confidence in him. It's just about him going out there and executing. And I think he has the talent. It's just um, you know, it's about staying in the pocket, making those throws. Um, it's just like I said, it's the simple things, but I also think that they can get him more involved. Um, another, you know, issue with is the wide receivers. I think, you know, they have talent. They have a lot of talent at wide receiver. They can throw their hat in the ring for wide receiver you certainly, but is Justin Ross being best utilized out of the slot? Is, you know, if Joseph Nagata and, and EJ Williams, are, are you putting your best three receivers on the field? Sure, but are you putting them where they need to succeed? I, I think – they like Ross in the slot because they don't have that slot guy that they've had in years past, like maybe a Hunter Renfro. They don't have that on this team. So, um, and, and they do like, they do like Bo and Dakari Collins who are true freshmen, but are, are they really ready to throw a true freshman wide receiver in the mix? I, you just don't know. But um, yeah, I, I think that's another thing is just, they just, the receivers and the quarterback haven't been on the same page and that needs to change obviously. And um, you know, the route running and, and that sort of stuff. And, um, they have, I, I think I'd be remiss to say they have a whole lot of talent and it's proven it's just about it all coming together. Um, you know, we're talking about the offense. I, I mean, we'll just run through every position here, I guess the running backs I've been impressed with, um, obviously with the offensive line, you would, you would think that the running game would kind of be stout, but well, Shipley's a true freshman and, and the kid can, can run, um, between the tackles. I, I, he's, he's aggressive. He's, I don't think a lot of fans knew just how much he, he can, you know, be, they probably looked at him as more of a ground guy, but he, he can be that pound guy too. Um, and obviously Lynn J Dixon left the program this week. He entered the transfer portal. That kind of had been a long time coming um, as, as Dabo previously mentioned, he was in CJ Spiller's doghouse. Um, he was benched for the first half against Georgia due to um, I think with the disciplinary whatever. So, so that kind of came to a fruit came to a head and I don't think much of anybody was surprised, but, you know, Dabo uh, on Tuesday officially named Shipley the starting running back, which is kind of big for Shipley because he has Raleigh roots. Um, I I believe some of his family went to NC state. So so that'll be a a nice, I guess, little homecoming for him. And they have a nice one, two combination in in him and pace. And, um, and I mean, you've seen all these running backs leave like Marcus Bowman and, um, the running back to left for Wisconsin, his name is escaping my head, and and now Lynn J. Dixon. Um, but you still have a lot of depth there. And I know a guy like Phil Moffa is somebody that they would have liked to a red shirt, but now Phil Moffa might become your, your third running back at this point. It might be a guy who who has to see the field at, at this point because I think at this point Clemson's got to do whatever it takes to win. And uh, so far those those wins haven't exactly been pretty, but um, you know, a win is a win no matter how ugly. And I, th- I think James Skowski will tell will tell you that. Um especially that, I mean, that play at the end, but yeah, I mean, that, that, that's overall the offense. I think glossing through it, you say, okay, you, a lot of things are not, are not going so well here, but fortunately they have a defense that that's playing probably at the highest level that of any defense in the country right now. Yeah. We'll, we'll touch in, in that just a little bit. Uh, Will, uh, go ahead. Cause I mean, there's a lot to dissect mm-hmm. here. Uh, Sam's given us a, a great, Uh, a bit of groundwork to work with here. So let's go from there. Yeah, definitely. And one of the points I wanted to make uh, as you were talking and listening to you, Sam, and and even looking at the depth chart that 
Yeah, this is a ton of talent. I mean, these are guys that, you know, a lot of them are coming off the, the 2019 class, which I think at the time was one of the highest uh, rate ranked recruiting classes ever. And really is they just, they just don't, they haven't meshed yet. Cause there's, they're still young. Is that something that maybe Clemson fans just need to uh, be a little more patient about? Yeah, yeah, yes and no. I, I think Dabo has, has talked about some years that you, he, he, I mean, he was asked some questions about national reporters about um, on Tuesday, just about the level of turnover. And some years you're experienced, and some years you're inexperienced. And I think they have a case of where it's both. You have, um, you lost guys like Trevor Lawrence and Travis Etienne to the NFL, but then at the same time, you, we're able to get six years out of guys like Nolan Turner and James Skowski. So I, th- I think there's inexperience and there's experience, but I think they're inexperienced at, at, at some key spots at, in that, and that's what's hurting them. So you talked about the, uh, the, the running back issue, obviously Lynn J. Dixon uh, entered the transfer portal. And as you mentioned, this was something that it sounded like it'd been kind of br- been brewing, obviously with the disciplinary issue. Plus he got passed up by a couple of younger guys. So do you expect uh, so do you expect Will Shipley to get the bulk of the carries and how much uh, of a role do you think Pace will have in the offense going forward? I, I would say that Shipley will I mean da- Dabo naming him the starter and instead of having that or uh, designation on the depth chart probably holds some weight. Um, I believe he had 20 something carries against Georgia Tech. I would I would imagine that he'll probably be, you know, I don't think he'll be that bell cow back where he's getting 30 carries a game, but I imagine that he'll, he'll probably carry the load of the carries and, and pace will be in there as a complimentary complimentary guy. Cause they do some different things. I think, you know, where that you get in the trouble there is, is they not trouble, but per se, because Phil Moffa, they're very excited about him. And he, he brings it something that's, that's very different than Shipley. He, he's kind of a bigger back um, than, than Shipley and pace, but they really wanted to redshirt him. Now that might be taken off the table, um, because you're looking if they have Darian Rencher, who, who's a six, who's another super senior, um, and, and they trust him, but, you know, he's obviously not their first option. And then you have Michael Dukes, who they also trust and they like. But, um, yeah, once once you get to that third running back, there are a bit of question marks, but I, I don't expect it to be an even split between Shipley and Pace. I, I, I don't know what the carries might look like, but I think Shipley would, would probably get a little bit more just because of that starter designation. And, and he, he's, I mean, through – three games. I I mean, you could probably wipe that first game off the table. You know, he he got four carries against one of the best defensive lines in the country and and forget about it. I mean, they they weren't going to be able to run the ball against Georgia, but uh, you know, first the, these past two games, I I think he's earned the right to, to be the starter. And Kobe Pace has also looked good as well. So I think they have, it's not, I don't wouldn't consider it a problem, but I think they have a a nice one, two complimentary duo right there. So go back to DJU for a second. Um, could somebody? I know you mentioned the struggles of just not having quite the rapport with uh, some of these some of these players, but could the fact that you know those he looks so great in those two games he played last year, but then again at the same time these uh, coaches have had months to uh, study the film on him. Could the fact that uh, he had those two games also have a little bit of effect on his early season performance? Since these coaches have had time to look at that film and and kind of you know catch his strengths and weaknesses. I think it, it could. I mean, you know, we. I think people came in expecting him to kind of, you know, be a Heisman front winner just the way that he played last year. But he he also was thrusted into an offense where you had experienced skilled players. You had Amari Rogers, Travis Etienne, guys like that. Um, and, and this is, you know, different. Um, I, I think his issues are more fundamental. So I, I don't I don't know if it's what opposing defenses are showing him and, and whatnot. I know what Georgia Tech showed Clemson is not what they're expecting. Obviously, I don't, I don't think South Carolina State really showed anything that obviously yeah. caused some trouble. I think some of the throws that he missed were, were just fundamentally just not there. And and the thing is, is he just kind of sat putting too much in the. So I think, you know, maybe, maybe they're showing, you know, obviously that Clemson didn't have an easy time scoring the football against Georgia and Georgia Tech. So I think, you know, those defense – different defensive looks that they got. Maybe, maybe it could play in the deal, but I think the, the bottom line with DJ is just his fundamentals just just haven't been completely there. Uh, one of the reasons, Sam, that, that uh, we wanted to have you on the program was because of the level of, of knowledge it, that you have on the Clemson Insider podcast that, that we've watched, but also because you are new and you, you haven't quite, <laughs> gotten to the point where you're you're 
too far into it, you still have that outsider's view, which gives a, a much better perspective. I think a more realistic perspective sometimes. And we're, we're all guilty of that. We, we get into it for a period of time and then we start pulling for one team or the other. Uh, <clears throat> let's talk about what Tony Elliott and Robbie Caldwell have uh, cut out for them. Um, if they can get this offensive line clicking, which more than likely they will. Now, when that happens, eh, anybody's guess, right? But when that happens, um, talk to us a little bit about, about how f- effective and, and, you know, you, you ran down some of the, the issues that DJ has with, he's probably overthinking right at this point, you know, he's, he's struggling with a line that's collapsing somewhat on him and not giving him enough protection. So he's overthinking it and rushing. Um, but he does have a heck of a, a cannon on him. Right. And uh, he has shown that he's pretty effective. He has a wide receiving core from what I can see that if he, if he has the line giving him significant protection, everything clicks there and he has the time he's going to pick people apart. Talk about that dynamic about uh, let's project into the future that DJ gets a line that's working. He doesn't have to overthink and he gets in stride and he starts hitting his wide receivers. Tell us what kind of damage this team can do. Well, you talk, I mean, you talked about his arm and I think before the season Clemson's quarterback coach Brandon Streeter said that DJ is the most impressive arm he's ever seen. Um, but just going back to your point, I think, you know, or the, the most impressive arm that he's coached, but just going back to your point, like, like you said, I think, you know, once they get that clicking and, and hopefully it's sooner than later that you, you'll see a quarterback is probably more comfortable in the pocket. Um, you know, trusting what he sees and, and maybe, you know, just trusting that he can make those throws. And uh, I don't think it's a confidence issue. I, like I said, I just think it's fundamentals, but obviously having a clean pocket will, will certainly help. And um, I, I, with their offensive line, it's, I think it's something they've talked about is just communication issues. And um, hopefully that's something that can get cleared up, but I think you'll see, you know, offense that can hopefully be explosive. They'll have time in the pocket to make some plays. You know, they haven't had really any explosive plays through this first three games. And, and that's something that's been missing because Clemson's often been a, been a team that's been able to rifle off explosive plays in the past. And they just haven't been able to this year, but even, even with, you know, DJ getting more comfortable in the pocket, I think we can go back to the running game as well. Um, you know, Obviously, there, there's a difference between, you know, Mac ba- Matt Bachor saying, hey, like, if you want to run that same defense, like, against us that Georgia Tech did, like, other ACC teams do that, let's spot the ball and let's go and we'll run the ball against you. We'll put our hands down in dirt. And, I mean, there's a difference between spotting the ball and executing. Um, obviously, Clemson would like to run the football for more than 3.9 yards per game. Um, I, I think that goes without saying. I think they they didn't probably dominate the run game as, as – not that they that they think they did, but maybe as, you know, people who watched the game would be like, oh, wow, they ran the ball this X amount of times. They they didn't. So, um, you know, I think obviously, you know, as cliche as it sounds, the football games are one in the trenches. So once maybe you can get that that run game going up to, to set the passing game up and maybe just taking that ease off of DJ's shoulders, I, I really think a lot of the key is, is just this offensive line gelling. Um, and, and I think that's, that's kind of, you know, um, probably just, just kind of soaked into, you know, some of the issues that he's having fundamentally. And like you said, maybe overthinking, maybe, maybe just trying, trying to do too much. So I, I think once they get things cleaned up there, and like you said, we don't, we don't really know when that happens, but if it happens sooner than later or sooner than later, I think they have a good chance to start putting up some points against some, some tougher opponents. Um, just looking at the schedule here, um, at, at one point, the uh, the Boston College game looked like it was going to be something uh, to, to have to deal with. It's not looking quite that way now. We'll see what Boston College looks like against Mizzou. Um, they still could be something to be a challenge for Clemson. NC State. Um they also have the ability to to come at you on both ends of the ball, offense, defense, probably one of the better packages, to be honest with you, that Clemson's going to be going up against on their schedule that I can see, that in Boston College. Um, 
what are some of the things that you're hearing out of out of uh, the coaching staff in regard to how they're going to approach NC State? Um, well, you know, I, um, that's a good question. I, I think that, you know, NC State's a very experienced – they have a very experienced defense. I think nine of 11 – of their guys that have starting experience. And even those two other guys have, have, you know, started games in the past. Um, obviously they're missing their, um, their, their linebacker who's the heart and soul of that team who, who probably could have, you know, been the ACC defensive player or at least thrown player of the year, at least throwing his hat in the ring. It's going to be tough to beat Brian Brzee this year, but um, that, that's a, that's a brutal blow, but I, I think they know the challenge that, that they're going into. Um, Dabo tonight said that, you know, his, his ears were still ringing from the, the crowd noise that they were pumping him during practice. So they're there. I think, you know, they're going in this game. They're vulnerable. They have a target on their back. Um, I think NC state sees that, you know, it, it, they're going to hostile environment, their first true road game of the year, because you can't really count the game in Charlotte as a road game and neutral site. And, you know, Clemson's a little bit closer to, to Charlotte than, than uh, Athens is. So um, even though I think it was pretty even in the crowds, but, um, yeah, no, this is their first true road game. And really it's, I mean, it, it could make or break their season, honestly. I, I mean, it's as cliche as, as that sounds, it's, um, they, they really could find themselves in trouble. And I think Dave Dorn said this week that, you know, obviously they, they saw what Georgia tech did defensively. And I think you're going to see teams try and emulate that. So it's kind of up to Clemson to adjust to that. And, and really respond. And that's what they talked about this week um, on the offensive side of the ball. They have a very talented quarterback and Devin Leary. And, and, and I mean, he, he's going to give them trouble defensively. They have a great defense. I honestly, you know, I don't want to sit here and, and say, Hey, like predict um, how many touchdowns they're going to score, but I, I would be surprised if NC state doesn't break that, that record of, of um, Clemson giving up offensive touchdowns. And not to say that NC that NC, that Clemson's defense isn't good or NC state's offense is, is all world. I, I think it, they just have a little bit more talent offensively and, and can probably get, um, you know, sneak in, especially with a, with a game at, on at home. Um, you know, it, it's going to be a tough game for them. I really think that this is um, as of now, I, I really think it's the toughest game on their schedule. It, it really is. And, um, and if, you know, NC state was fully healthy, I, I think you you'd, Clemson would be a little bit more, hesitant heading heading into this game but um I think they're they're aware of the challenge ahead I think they know that they're going to see similar looks to what they did against Georgia Tech or or maybe you know NC State will try and throw them off their their heels a little bit as well but um it's definitely a difficult task ahead and and I think they're ready for it but I guess we'll have to see once we spot the football at uh 3 30 on Saturday so uh you touched a little bit on this up up front when about the fans um, and I don't remember how long ago this has been. Maybe Will can remind me. It's either been a, a year or two that we talked on on the podcast um, about the fact that at some point this is the kind of season that was going to happen <clears throat> and whether or not the fans would be ready for it, whether they would look at it and go, hey, this is an adjustment. Sometimes you have down years, et cetera. Tell me uh, – how are the fans processing in general? I mean, we can, we can throw out some of the, the meatheads and, you know, because it's really not worth talking about them, but the people who are your, your mainline fans, how are they reacting to the start so far? I, I think they're disappointed. Um, obviously because I think you expect to go in that South Carolina game, South Carolina state game and hang 60 points. You go into the Georgia tech game and, and hang 60 points. I mean, they hung out, they hung there with Georgia. You throw away that game and say, okay, this is the best defense. One of the best defenses in the country. It, it, it was, you know, a bowl game like atmosphere, just, you know, let's get better from it and, and learn from it. And um, I think a lot of fans reacted to that game. Probably it was very reactionary. I think a lot of the, a lot of it right now, I would say the fans, um, you know, I, I wish I had the temperature on the fans because you can only, you know, take so much for what's said on, on the message boards and, and Facebook and that sort of stuff for, um, you can only, that only holds so much weight, but at the same time, I think, you know, I, I would probably just constitute them as, as being a little reactionary right now, because, you know, it's a, in fairness to them, this is not something they're used to seeing. Um, and I think, 
and they're expecting a little bit of a smoother transition from from Trevor to DJU than than they've gotten, and that might be probably the root of the frustration. But I think um, also at the same time, you, you know, their defense was strong. I mean, their defense was strong last year, but obviously it got exploited against Ohio State. Um, but the, but the defense that we've seen this year, I, I think it's kind of just be like, well, now we got the defense, and, and they were hoping that the offense was, you know, going to put up all these points. But um, I, I think it's you know it's probably not the right fan base to ask to be patient just because they're used to winning, winning, winning. Um, you know, I, I, that's just from, you know, my perspective here. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's, you're not going to see a lot of patience with, with DJ. Unfortunately, I think he, he deserves to have some patience, but um, you know, the, the, the fans here, the fan, the players here with, the, I mean, Tony Elliott talked about week week after week one, um, how fans were telling him to go back to Michelin and that sort of stuff. It's like we see that stuff and it hurts. And DJ has, has gotten a ton of criticism. And um, you know, Matt Bockhorst said he's he's an offensive lineman, and offensive linemen eat, eat criticism for breakfast. So um, I think a lot of these guys know how to turn out the outside noise and. And that's kind of what Dabo is, is preached with his program. And I mean, you've often heard that there's, you know, some sort of, you know, there's sometimes can be an agenda against Clemson just because they play in the ACC and, and not the SEC and, and whatnot. And um, I think Dabo does a good job of making sure that the program tunes out the outside noise. But yeah, I, th- I think you're, you're looking at a frustrated fan base that, that could definitely be happy, uh, definitely, you know, not be won over because I don't think they need to be won over, but, be back in their good graces. If, if, you know, you you can go to um, you can go to NC state and and put up some points and and walk away with a win, but. Just, uh, just from our perspective on the outside, because, you know, ACC nation, we cover everybody. Okay. Mm -hmm. From our perspective on the outside, looking in, this is what I would tell Clemson fans, bring it down. It's, it's going to be okay. And I know you don't have the patience, just like you pointed out, but bring it down. It's going to be okay. Will? Yeah. So let me uh, just uh, get on to the NC State game. Aside from offensive continuity, is stopping NC State's running game kind of the key to victory in that game? I, I would say absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, they've done a pretty good job of, of stopping the run game in the past uh, couple of games. And I, I think that's, you know, something that they're going to um, definitely, you know, try and hang their hat on and, and, and go forth, obviously not having Tyler Davis who's out for now seven, eight weeks because he um, in, injured his bicep it is huge, but um, they, they like the depth that they have at that position. I mean, you might see some mixing and matching across that defensive line. Cause you know, you never can know what you expect out of Brent Venables, but uh, they like the depth that they have it into your defensive line. It's, it's time for some of those guys to step up. But I think, yeah, like you said, uh, I mean, football games are usually one in the trenches. So I think if they, they can, really stop what NC state has been capable of doing in the, in the ground game and, and maybe win that turnover battle, that that's something that you, you're looking for the keys for victory there for sure. So we've, we've mentioned James Skalski's name a couple of times, somewhat in gist, but also, you know, as a, as someone who's been a key part of this defense. And, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of comparisons to, uh, to someone he, he, who kind of, he took over from has been bullware, but, uh, what is Skalski as a vet, kind of a veteran senior, meant for this defense in terms of a leadership role? I think it means everything. I mean, you just, yeah, everybody can just see, you know, the reaction to when he made that play, and they're like, "Yep, instincts." Like he just knows everything. They, I mean, he might not be the fastest, he might not be the most athletic guy in the field, but you know, he's like a coach out there, um, and you know, he made that play because of instincts, because he he knew what he was seeing and, and he saw it and. Um, especially that play, but we also talked to uh, got in the media got a chance to talk to Levante Bentley, who, who replaced Balin Specter this past weekend, and because Specter was out due to some inflammation, or the, this past Saturday, I should say, and he talked about how Skowski is just one of those guys who, you know, they make sure that they watch film with them and and you know, kind of just show them the ropes and and what it means to 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 you know reach that standard and. You know, he didn't, he didn't, uh, Bentley didn't exactly like peel back the curtain on everything, but th- the the thinking you got is he's pretty much like a coach on, on the field. Um, and he's clearly respected by his teammates and, and, you know, they would, um, I mean, one of the picture that our photographer t- took, Bart Boatwright kind of went viral on social media. Um, 
he, it's a it's a picture of Skowski all bloody with KJ Henry having his arm wrapped around him. And I, and I think that kind of just shows the uh, after after he made that play, I think that kind of just shows in essence like what what he means to this team. And you know he's he's got a heart of the champion. I mean he, he's got more rings than than fingers at this point, and and he, he gives it his all on on every on every play. I mean he even admitted it wasn't his his it was his worst game of the season. Um, I, th- I think, and you know, I that's you know him being a veteran and, and a guy who who knows what to say. But um, you know, he, he made the play when it needed to be made, and then I mean, I think that just speaks to who he is as 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 a player and and what you know Clemson's all about is, is definitely a guy like James Skowski, and I think they're lucky to have him back for this year. You know, the the circumstances surrounding why they were able to get him back, obviously, you know, you would have liked for that not to happen, but. Um, I, I'm sure Clemson was very happy to have him back, even though they have some talented linebackers who are ready to, to jump in and, and play. But I mean, the, the way that he made that play on Saturday, was just like, yep, this, this is why this guy's out there giving his all every play. So I know that, uh, you know, obviously last season during the playoff, the, the secondary got torched against Ohio state. Have you been impressed with how big of a turnaround this uh, secondary's played in these are in this early part of the season? Um, yeah. Uh, yes and no. I think, um, I mean, I think there's a level of standard that you expect and and obviously they were going to get that stuff cleaned up because it left that sour taste in, in their mouth after Ohio state. Um, but uh, you know, Andrew McCuba has come in there as, as a true freshman and really just, you know, very, yeah, I, I would say impressed is the word because I mean, I've just been impressed with the way that Andrew McCuba has come in. And I think, you know, I expected Mario Goodrich and, and Andrew Booth Jr. to, to come in and, and be stout cornerbacks, but they both are playing at a high level and, and both being very physical tacklers. I think, you know, they, they're among, you know, some of the team leaders and tacklers. Um, and then obviously Nolan Turner was out for a little bit, but, you know, Joseph Charleston and, and uh, Jalen Phillips did a good job of, of filling in for him. So I think, um, yeah, no, the secondary has been impressive. It really has been. They haven't allowed a, a lot of, you know, you know, everything's kind of been in front of them. I don't think they've really allowed, you know, any deep passes and any explosive plays. Um, I've, I've been impressed. I, I think, um, you know, th- I kind of have finally had a chance to kind of hone in and look at Andrew Booth Jr. I know people before the season, like this guy might be the best cornerback in college football. He could be a first round pick just watching him you know, getting a chance to watch him play every Saturday is, you know, you can't really take that for granted. He, he's a great talent. And I think he's um, showing what he's made of. And I think the cornerback room was a question mark coming into the season, not because of the talent, but because of the lack of depth. Obviously you had Darian Kendrick leave the program. Um, and then, you know, he's at Georgia now and, and Fred Davis, obviously his issues. I, I, I think he was suspended. Uh, well, never officially said, but he didn't play in the first game. So you can assume that was a one game suspension. Now he's back in there. Um, but they, you know, Malcolm green has looked good in that nickelback role that, that they have him playing. He, he played some more for once Trenton Simpson got um, ejected from, from last week's game and Sheridan Jones has looked good as well. Um, just overall, I mean, they have the talent in the corner, uh, in the cornerback room. That's for sure. The depth there was, was that question mark coming into the season. But uh, like you said, um, I, I surprised. Yeah, definitely with some of the play with in Makuba, but I think they, they've all rose kind of rose to the occasion and, and kind of, you know, stepped up when their teams needed them. Clemson at NC state. And I'll tell you what, um, home field advantage, Clemson defensive advantage. This is going to be an interesting game. And Sam, thank you so much for joining us, talking to us, uh, giving us an idea of what's going on with, with Clemson behind the scenes with, with the offense and a little view of some other things as well. It's uh, it's great to have you on from the Clemson insider, Sam Newman. It's been our special guest and thanks for talking Clemson football, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Want more ACC sports news and interviews? Make accnation.net your homepage or follow us on Google News. Be sure to subscribe to ACC Nation on your favorite podcast or streaming radio platform. While you're there, we'd appreciate a rating and your support through PayPal. Follow us on social media at ACC Nation. And you'll find Will on Twitter at Will's World MN, and I'm at ACC The Q. Until next time, cheers. Score.